and you can still do just a couple of minutes of intro banters, keep your conversation going while everybody gets. So anyway, the hay bales have been uh, like Florida Department of Ag is involved. Um, you know, all of that is set and going so that we, you know, like they're, they're working on getting them the things that they, they need to start typing it out. So. And do they know if there were deliveries from the same batch to other sources or is that part of the investigation still? Um, I don't know that we know the answer directly to that. Um, so I don't, I don't have that answer, but I know that there is, um, kind of full cooperation from everyone involved. So we will have those answers. Gotcha. Um, we just don't have them on at the moment. So, okay. um, you know, like I said, it's 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 tragic and and all of those things, but everyone involved has been really really good about trying to get it figured out and solved and understanding that, you know, it is it is what it is, right? Like there's no there's no great answer to what's going on now. So, right. um, what we're doing right now is just giving everybody a chance to kind of get on. Um, it's nine fifty seven. So Facebook is going to send out a notification that we are live. And so we're just getting everybody a moment to, to kind of get on here and we're chit chatting about what's going on. Um, but again, like I said, associated with the, the big pasture blocks, which, you know, my understanding, we can go over all this again, but my understanding for Florida is, is, you know, that's kind of typical is that, that hay ends up being a source for us. Is that reasonable? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the it, it's not considered an endemic area for the soil because the soil type isn't quite right for for bot b uh to be a high growth area but because florida doesn't grow the majority of its own hay uh there's hay that's shipped in from potentially endemic areas and, and that's where the majority of the risk is going to come from okay uh, and while any forage is a potential source. In general, the larger compressed uh, bales, round bales or large square bales are going to be your most likely uh, culprits. But um, you know, I saw someone online say it doesn't happen in small bales or something like that. that that's not accurate either. So yeah, uh, certainly can come from anywhere. Uh, and uh, as we talked about before, the, the amount of spoilage that is required for there to be uh, a, a lethal source of botulism isn't even necessarily visible. So it doesn't have to be bales that look bad. You know, there aren't a whole lot of horsemen who go out there and say, oh yeah, I fed some real junk bales. I'm not surprised that we got botulism. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's always, everything looked fine. Uh, so Because it's, it's very tiny amounts of the toxin, right? That can, can take out a horse. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the... The, a single colony of bacteria can produce 10,000 lethal doses in a day. Whew. So. You know, one has to ask why you develop this level of toxicity, Clostridium. <laughs> but it's been successful for them. You can find Clostridium botulinum across the entire world, uh, every continent, and even in some aquatic environments. So um, it's, a, it's a system that has worked for botulism. For wow. Sure. Huh. Oh. Can you see? All right, I, I seem to have video. I'm, I've got a comment that the video is not working, but um, it looks like it's working on my end. So hold on, I'm just double checking some stuff here right now. Okay, looks like it's working for us. Um, what I can say is sometimes trying a different browser will make videos work as well. Um, so. Okay. All right. It does look like it's working for us. So I'm just going to start a little bit here. This uh, Today we've got Dr. Lyman here. He is from the company Neogen, which makes the vaccine that is available for botulism. As we know in Florida, we are all on a little bit of freak out right now about botulism. 
we aren't used to having it in our area. It does happen in other parts of the United States um, with, with some frequency. So we're going to talk a little bit about what it is, where it comes from, and what options we have for managing the risk to our horses. Um, and as the manufacturer of the vaccine, certainly you may think, oh, he's just trying to sell vaccine. But it also means that Dr. Lyman has, uh, along with that knowledge about the vaccine, become very knowledgeable about botulism in general, I imagine. Um, so let's start a little bit where we were a moment ago. And uh, for Florida, where does this typically come from? Yeah, so botulism in horses is almost always associated with what's called forage poisoning, which means there's, there's preformed toxin in the forage that they consume. And in the majority of cases in Florida, because you're not growing your own hay, you're importing hay, uh, it's imported hay that's coming from higher risk areas. And so while you don't think of Florida as a, a classic hotspot of botulism, any hay that comes from a hotspot poses potential risk there. Uh, and, the, and the toxin is formed when there are Clostridium botulinum spores uh, that are actually picked up from the soil in the endemic areas when the hay is, is cut. Uh, and those spores then just need some conditions where it's uh, warm and slightly uh, wet, which is what conditions you find on the inside of a, a compressed bale. And that's why those large round bales, large square bales are, are your highest risk feeds. Uh, well, I shouldn't say the highest, the highest risk feeds are deliberately fermented feeds like haylage or silage. Um, which is part of the reason we don't generally feed those to horses. But then you have those large bales that are kind of the next level of risk. Um, and with conditions for growth, they produce the toxin. The toxin is actually stable for a very long time. So the bale doesn't have to be hot or wet when it's fed. It just has to have been hot or wet at some point during its processing and storage. And you get incomplete fermentation, warming it up and, and allowing for growth of those bacteria and production of the toxin. Oof. Uh, so someone has a question about what is the risk stratification of forage sources and is there a screening test? Uh, there's no good screening test that I'm aware of. I mean, certainly you can test forage for the presence of uh, botulinum neurotoxin, but it's not it's not as simple as a quick ELISA or a sample, something like that. It has to be sent off to a lab that's capable of doing that work. So it's not routinely done. In terms of stratification, I think I kind of just touched on that. Fermented yeah. feeds would be the first. Uh, the highest risk, haylage, silage um, are, are very high risk. And, and that's usually due to incomplete fermentation occurring. So it heats up, but it doesn't drop the pH quickly enough um, to prevent the growth of botulism. Second then would be your large bales, um, large round bales or large compressed square bales, uh, then moving down to more standard small bales. Uh, and then we've actually seen cases of botulism associated with pelleted feeds and even with uh, the small compressed hay cubes. Uh, pretty rare. Uh, those are usually due to uh, moisture, you know, stored on the ground and some moisture ends up contaminating those sources. But uh, the spores themselves are almost everywhere. Uh, you know, you know, even in wounds from horses in endemic areas, if you go back and look at them in histology later, you'll see evidence of spores contaminating the wounds. So. And it seems like because, you know, you, you can't necessarily test even begin to test a shipment of hay because you can have teeny tiny amounts of this toxin in one spot, correct? And, you know, like if you're testing over here and it's over here, you're not necessarily going to find it, even though that's enough to kill 10,000 horses. Yeah, absolutely. The, the amount that is required for a lethal dose is uh, nanogram amounts. It's ridiculously small. Uh, in one colony, like we were talking about earlier, the, just the amount that fits on the head of a pin can produce 10,000 lethal doses in a day. And so, um, you know, in cases like this, obviously there was fairly widespread um, contamination. But in a lot of cases, you'll just have a single bale out of a, a shipment of hundreds 
that is affected because it was on the ground uh, or it got wet or, you know, whatever conditions were unique to that bale. So you do see large outbreaks like this uh, where multiple uh, locations, multiple horses are affected. And that's what makes botulism scary. But you also get a lot of one-off cases in endemic areas where for for no good reason that you can identify a single horse was exposed to it. So how do we look at our horses and decide that potentially we've got botulism going on? Like if we're a bit suspicious. Yeah. So the, the first clinical signs that show up are going to be decreased eyelid tone, decreased tail tone and decreased tongue tone. Uh, but a lot of horses move very rapidly past those, so you don't always necessarily see them. But almost every horse that's affected by botulism is going to show those. Uh, and so the tongue hanging out the side of the mouth, or if you pull the tongue, there's no resistance back on it, um, as well as decreased eyelid tone. The eyes will look a little, uh, a little soft, and you can just easily open the eyelid up, which... Uh, remember when it's we spoke not before, normal. right? Most horses, you know, have the strength of a thousand men in their uh, in their eyelids, uh, and the same with the tail. It gets very easy to lift up and down and manipulate. Um, a lot of people will mistake early signs for choke because they'll see horses that are able to apprehend feed, but they can't coordinate the muscle movements to swallow it, and so you'll see grain and slobber around the mouth, and and they'll think it's choke. Um, and then it'll progress on to muscle tremors, generalized weakness. Uh, the animals will get down, recumbent, unable to stand. Uh, by that point, you're dealing with pretty severe symptoms. And once they become recumbent, your odds of recovery are pretty low. Uh, that's kind of the threshold. If, if you have a down horse with botulism, you have very low likelihood of recovery. So, okay. Um, Catching those early signs and getting antitoxin into them quickly at that point is about the only thing you can do to have a positive outcome here from the treatment side. Okay. I just want to kind of touch on those things so that we could then um, go into, you know, treatment is an option, but what about prevention? Yeah, treatment's certainly an option, but it's very expensive uh, and often unrewarding. You know, and Penn put out study uh, a number of years ago looking at horses that came into clinic and showed uh, once they were recumbent I, I think they were only 20 percent survival in recumbent horses cool. um, and i, I want to say overall they're about 75 uh, percent recovery total for horses that stayed on their feet so even in horses that were on their feet coming into the clinic it, it wasn't good but i imagine uh, this was also quite costly you know whenever we get into profoundly neurologic horses. It takes very specialized nursing care. Uh, you know, I imagine the antitoxin is, is sort of a plasma type deal. So, you know, then you're talking about a whole nother level of, of veterinary care. And, and again, like I said, lots of nursing care. Yeah, absolutely. Even just the introduction of, of the antitoxin is generally expensive and it is obviously emergency visits. Some animals require more than one dose of it. Uh, and you have to administer the antitoxin before you've confirmed that you have botulism. So you're doing it as a, a stopgap measure, I guess, until you're, okay. you're confirming it. Um, if you're administering it by the time the horse is down, you aren't really doing a whole lot of good. Okay. And unfortunately, the the duration of treatment is pretty high. You're, you're talking ICU for seven plus days for most of these horses. So, uh, so in a, a question about, you know, for most of our neurologic diseases, when we have a horse that gets profoundly impacted like this, even if we get them through our rule of thumb is that we don't get back the same horse we started with. Is that true with botulism as well? Uh, not a lot of good data on that, but there have been some, uh, anecdotes, I guess, you know, in Kentucky, we see it a lot in foals, unfortunately, and, and those foals do go on to have relatively normal careers. Um, in a high level athlete that's been, been trained, you're, you're talking months of recovery at a minimum. Um, and I would say in an uncomplicated case, there's no lasting damage to the nerves. Uh, this is all a peripheral. There's no central nervous damage associated with it. It's all out in the, um, in the peripheral nervous system, and it's just a blockade of the neurotransmitter. Once that, that end plate regrows and is able to uh, appropriately fire again, it, it fires normally. But again, in, in 
in the more severe cases, you're talking about a horse that's down for seven to 10 days. Uh, that on its own is a problem, right? And so it's a the, huge problem. It, exactly. The potential damage from pressure sores, from nerve damage in the periphery, just to being down, not due to the botulism directly, those can have lasting impacts that will prevent future athletic performance. Okay. Let's talk about better prevention. Okay. <laughs> absolutely. Vaccination. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So the, the vaccine's been out for a long time, uh, and, and we know a lot about it. it. I practiced in Kentucky before I came to Neogen. And in Kentucky, it's standard practice. You vaccinate everything for botulism, because if you don't, you'll see botulism. It, it's that prevalent here. Um, but the vaccine is, it's a three-dose initial series with an annual booster after. Uh, in cases like this, where people are really nervous about rapid protection, I always want to remind them there really isn't a whole lot of protection until after that second dose. Um, you don't see an appreciable tighter increase until after the second injection. So um, just because you've put a jab in the horse, uh, to use our current uh, language, I guess, doesn't mean you're protected on day one. Uh, but you do get some protection after the second dose, and after the third is when you generate that lasting immune response. Uh, to date, we don't have any horses that have had a diagnosis of botulism after they've been fully vaccinated. Uh, I do have a couple cases in Sweden where they reported some cases of uh, botulism in horses that had only received two doses. Uh, so it is important to complete that entire primary series. But um, but it's been a very effective vaccine. It's a, a, a pretty clean vaccine. You know, like I said, we used thousands of doses of this in practice before I ever came to Neogen. So um, it's, it's certainly a vaccine I believe strongly in. And I get asked a lot when I travel around which horses should be vaccinated. Um, you know, the AAP considers it a risk-based vaccine. So owners are supposed to have that conversation with their veterinarians about whether their horses are at risk. And that's where we always get into the discussion of <laughs> which horses are yeah. uh, and, and it, are horses in Florida. And, and the answer is horses in Florida are at less risk than those in Kentucky or Pennsylvania or up the uh, Atlantic states, but they're not at no risk. And so it really is a question of uh, how important is managing that risk to those horses. I always recommend horses that are traveling get vaccinated because they don't always have complete control over their forage source while they're traveling. Um, so, you know, sport horses, those that are being shipped, any horses that ship in and out of endemic areas should be vaccinated because you can even get it in pasture in endemic areas. Um, uh, horses that have, you know, real high value or high athletic training, this is pretty cheap insurance against a, a relatively rare but extremely devastating disease. Uh, and, and breeding stock is an absolute must uh, because foals are right, at relatively high risk in endemic areas as well. So. And so you vaccinate the mares typically like you do the foals where you vaccinate or for everything else, right? So you vaccinate kind of coming into just prior to, to parturition or foaling. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, 30 to 45 days out, you give a, uh, the annual booster to the mare just to make sure that she's got high cholesterol immunity uh, to pass on to the foal. And then we usually start the foals between three to six months, depending on whether they're in high risk or, or lower risk areas. Okay. And uh, the vaccine is, uh, we have found it to be readily available. Um, you guys, it's readily available through for the average veterinarian, I imagine, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Every major distributor carries it. Um, you can order direct from the agent too, but the majority of the distributors will, will have it to you uh, quickly and easily. Yeah, we were able to order doses on Monday and have it available in the clinic on Tuesday, so relatively readily. So um, we do have some questions, so I'm going to go through some questions for you. Um, we've covered some of this, but... Um, you know, we, we've got a question of like, should I try to get my horse vaccinated? I just bought small alfalfa orchard bales, or is it too late? And, you know, that goes back to that, that risk discussion for sure. Yeah. I, you know, prevention is, it's never too late to start, I guess. Um, like I said, it's not until the second injection that you're going to start to see significant protection from it. So, um, Yes, it's warranted. Is it going to protect you from a bale that's out there right now? No. Um, there are some speed up protocols that are done in emergency situations. That's 
it's off label. It's a discussion I can have with the vet, but you know, we're not going to uh, put that in a public forum, but. Well, so as uh, we always say, it's important to have a great relationship with your veterinarian so that you can have great conversations like this with them to establish, you know, is that appropriate for your scenario? And, you know, what is the risk factor for your horse, your farm, all of those things? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And, you know, if I had my choice, every horse would be vaccinated, right? This would, <laughs> this would be a core vaccine. And I say that not because I work for Neogen. I, I, I went to vet school in Illinois. Our, our entire discussion of botulism in Illinois was uh, if you feed round bales, vaccinate for botulism. And that was it. That was, that was botulism lecture in my equine vet class, right? So yeah. um, it, it wasn't until I came to Kentucky and started to actually see cases, see the impacts of it, uh, and, and realize what a devastating disease it is that it, it really started to hit home. And then since joining Neogen, what's really struck me is I don't get calls from Pennsylvania or Kentucky or the endemic areas. Those vets, they've all seen it before, but I get calls from all over the country and everyone Florida. starts with, <laughs> exactly. Everyone starts with, we've never seen this before. Uh, and so, you know, there is, there's no area of the country where you could say there's no risk there. Uh, you know, we get calls from Canada, we get calls all the way down to uh, the Southwest where they don't consider it an endemic area. But in the current world where we buy and broker and ship hay all over the country, uh, sometimes even the, in the areas that are growing their own hay, but maybe they didn't have a great season or just the cost is lower from somewhere else. Uh, I, there's no horse in the U.S. that's zero risk for botulism, in my opinion. Well, and for example, the the hay implicated here, you know, we're not sure, but everybody is is being, like I said, very cooperative. And and like you said, it's just a risk, right? But the hay implicated here came from the west western half of the United States somewhere. You know, it didn't come from endemic areas even. It didn't come from Kentucky, Pennsylvania, you know, those kinds of spots. So, you know, it's it's um we've got a question about kind of storing and bailing, but it sounds like, you know, this net probably happens during the initial processes. So certainly storing your hay in a, you know, dry appropriate place like you would for hay is, is good. But a lot of this happens before you Joe horse owner have the, the hay under your control. Right. I mean, th there are a number of things that can contribute to risk in the processing of the hay, just the, the height at which they're cutting it. Uh, what the soil conditions are, where they cut it, uh, how wet it is, how long it's down on the ground before it's baled. Uh, and then there are storage things that we can do. And, and you hit on them. I mean, it's pretty simple, right? Keep it keep it clean and dry, right? Um, don't store on the ground um, and, and don't allow it to get wet and ferment after it's been processed. Uh, but yeah, none of it is is a guarantee. I mean, there's there's no hay producer out there that can say with 100% certainty there's there's no botulism in this hay. Um, right. It, it's botulism spores, like I said, they are everywhere. Uh, in certain areas, they're so common that you can't take a soil sample without finding it. Um, Virginia Tech did a study where they went all over the country and pulled samples. And in Kentucky, as they took samples every 25 or 50 miles, I forget what it was across the state, every soil sample they took was positive for Bot B. <laughs> and so it, it's very common. And even in Florida, you'll see lots of uh, botulinum spores. It's just that the soil conditions aren't right for there to be growth of type B botulism. So. So speaking of type B, if we, we vaccinate, that generally protects them from the ones that, that horses are affected with? Yeah, so type B is the most common in horses by far. Somewhere between 85 and 90% of cases in, in horses are going to be type B botulism. Uh, there are cases of type A and there are cases of type C that come up periodically. Um, a is generally in the West uh, and it's generally associated with uh, paracute cases. So horses found dead in the field and, and you know, normal in the morning, dead by afternoon. Uh, type B, like I said, is the more classic versions, the ones where we see over a span of about a day that progression of clinical signs to recumbency um, in completely naive horses. It can be a little closer to paracute as well. And then type C, similar clinical signs to type B. 
but it's almost always associated with uh, carcass contamination of, of hay. Uh, and so, you know, in a case like this where you have multiple, uh, uh, multiple bales affected, it's less likely that it's associated with carcass contamination. And, and so it's less likely that it's type C. Um, not a guarantee until they type it out, you don't really know. But uh, interestingly enough, the botulinum spores are capable of producing uh, multiple types of toxin, and it's actually their environment that determines which toxin they produce. And so that's why we say type B is East Coast, because it's relatively uh, rich organic matter, whereas the drier acidic soils in the West favor type A uh, neurotoxin production. Okay. But you said the vaccine has, you have essentially pretty good data that the vaccine does a really good job of, of preventing botulism in horses. It, it does. It, it is only protective against type B. So mm -hmm. I, I don't want to um, to misspeak that when I uh, talk about those other types. Uh, it is a type B toxoid. It protects against type B. Uh, and there's actually no cross protection, unfortunately, against type A or type C. But in horses, the vast majority of cases are type B. And so it is the, the best solution out there for prevention of botulism in horses. Okay. Um, so on the vaccine, uh, typical, uh, is it, you know, we have some vaccines that we consider hot, like, uh, the pregnant mare pneumobort, for instance, you know, typically when I vaccinate for that, I'll have, you know, not huge reactions, but sore necks, some of that kind of stuff. How would you feel about this vaccine in terms of that? I have my experience with it has been that they haven't even noticed I vaccinated them. Yeah. I mean, it, any vaccine is potentially going to cause a fever or cause a local vaccine reaction. I don't consider this a real hot vaccine by any stretch. Our attack rate for adverse events is usually down in the uh, 10 thousandths of a percent. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, we, we get a couple calls a year of local reactions or something like okay. that, but it's, it's not what you would consider a hot vaccine. Okay. Uh, and once again, the, the routine protocol is the one vaccine a month apart for three shots, uh, and then they go on to an annual booster. So we had that question as well. We covered it, but I just want to make sure we covered it again. Um, and there's some questions about, you know, like feeding hay. So if you get these big bales, uh, opening them up, uh, will that reduce risk? You know, feeding it on the ground, will that increase risk? Are there feeding behaviors that increase or decrease risk? Um, slow consumption is probably your biggest risk on the feeding side. So if you have, uh, if you're feeding these large bales to only two horses in a field uh, and they take a month to get through the bale, uh, you have exposed risk there because as those horses walk down on the hay, you know, we've all seen them go try to dig into the center of the bale, right? And then they have hay all over the ground that they've walked in. Uh, that is very likely to ferment if it gets wet. So uh, you can get fermentation conditions just from them walking it down. So in general, the advice for feeding large bales would be only feed them in circumstances where you have enough horses to eat them down quickly. Okay. Um, and one more question on here that looks really good to me is, um, what is the risk of your neighbors? Hey, um, you know, like if your neighbors have round bales and you're not sure how well they've bailed them and there's some, you know, wind blowing hay into your field, like, I feel like that's pretty low risk, but good question in terms of wash off yeah. basically. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's no, there's no guarantees in biology. I, I would consider that pretty low risk as well. It's, it's going to generally be horses directly eating the contaminated feed. Um, there have been cases uh, where we haven't identified a source that uh, on that farm, we looked at their hay, we looked at their grain, we looked in their pastures, took soil samples and never actually found a potential source for it. So I suppose you, you can't rule out runoff or things like that in, in those cases, but I would consider that pretty rare. Okay. All right. Anything else you feel like we should know? Uh, no, you know, I, I think you, you've hit on it for me. This is a, a prevention disease. It is all about vaccination. Um, and while it's not a classic vaccine for Florida, it's, it's certainly warranted for horses at risk and, um, 
just want all the owners out there to talk to their veterinarian about it. And uh, I'm happy to talk to all the vets about it as to whether or not I think their horses are at risk in Florida. Awesome. All right. Well, as usual, guys, um, great information here. If you listen back to this later, because uh, the recording will be available. So if you're listening to us later and you've got questions we didn't address, if you want to drop them down below, the Spring Hill team will get them answered for you. It may involve consultation with Dr. Lyman here. But I want to thank you, Dr. Lyman, again, very, very much. You have definitely been our go-to botulism expert. We've got a podcast with you and a seminar with you, which we posted in re response to this. So I just want to say thank you very much for, for coming on and helping us answer some questions and allay some fears, hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Happy to help out and really uh, strongly believe in this vaccine and, and definitely would like to see botulism be uh, less <laughs> of a concern for our horse owners. Absolutely. All right. Thank you guys. Everybody have a great day out there. And again, got any questions, uh, drop them down below. We'll work on getting them answered for you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Lyman. Thank you.